Hey, good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many faces here today for a very important topic. Um, and just wanted to welcome everybody on behalf of the School of Health Administration at Dalhousie, as well as the alumni executive. Um, and this is being co-sponsored by the Canadian College of Health Leaders as well. So thank them for the support. So a great turnout, obviously, for a very important topic today, a very timely topic. Um, us in Canada, of course, are getting a lot of the news feed from what's going on in America right now. So it's great to have an open dialogue, especially from a Canadian perspective, uh, on this topic tonight. I just wanted to give a bit of a background on our Excellence in Health series before we begin and before I introduce Neil. So in 2008, the School of Health Administration established the public education program entitled Excellence in Health series. Um, and this was aimed at not only students and faculty within the uh, university, but also to encourage more of a dialogue between the university community as well as the public. So the series is designed to provide an open forum that's equally accessible and provides a large canvas upon which cutting edge topics are discussed from healthcare planning and management, funding and delivery, healthcare law and legislation to healthcare policy. The Excellence in Health series features national as well as international lecturers, each respected for their leadership on the topic of discussion, which brings us very well to uh, Dr. Neil McKinnon himself. So as many of you hopefully in this um, room know that uh, Dr. McKinnon is a Nova Scotian native, so we're happy to welcome him back here to, uh, for tonight's speech, and a former professor at Dalhousie University in the College of Pharmacy. He will be speaking about his experience working in the healthcare environment to the United States. Until July of this year, uh, Neil was the director of the Center for Rural Health in Arizona, which houses the State Office of Rural Health. Uh, and under his tenureship, they did win the two, 2013 Outstanding Rural Health uh, Office Award, uh, which is pretty much the highest achievement in that area. So uh, kudos to Neil for that as well. Um, so you can see he's already done some pharmacy, he's taught some health admin, we're looking at rural health policy as well. And now in his new role as dean at the um, James L. Winkle College of Pharmacy uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Neil works closely with other health uh, science deans and local hospitals and other health care providers uh, within that capacity. So today we're welcoming uh, Dr. Neil McKinnon to give us an overview of how the U.S. compares to Canada and other Western uh, industrialized nations in health care. Uh, he'll be reviewing the basics of Obamacare and discussing its implementation to date. Um, and then after uh, Dr. McKinnon's speech, we will have time to open up the floor uh, to some questions from the audience. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Neil McKinnon. All right. Can you hear me okay? Am I all right? Very good. Well, thanks so much for coming out. I know it's uh, an evening, or maybe you're I'm taking you away from family commitments or other things. So I really do appreciate uh, you coming out and choosing to spend your evening uh, with us. And just wanted to thank the School of Health Administration uh, for this series and for the invitation to come. And I'm really thrilled to talk with you tonight about uh, Obamacare. And uh, certainly, you know, I have to admit, it certainly is a tough subject in many ways to talk about. Uh, certainly, uh, it's tough to talk about the subject in the U.S. without bringing the politics into it. And hopefully, I've tried to leave most of that behind at the border. Um, but I have to tell you, working as a Canadian in the U.S. healthcare system, it's really hard to take the two apart. And I think, you know, as Canadians, certainly we may uh, disagree about different aspects of health care. But most Canadians generally agree, you know, for uh, it has to be a universal system. And we might disagree with some of the particulars, but I tell you what, that basic foundational agreement does not exist in the U.S. And so it makes it for an interesting time. When I did town halls like this uh, last year in Arizona, uh, you didn't know who was going to show up, and sometimes with firearms and other things as well. So <laughs> hopefully you checked your firearms out the door. That would, that would make me happy. Um, I don't know how many of you ch watched Saturday Night Live, but last, this weekend, Saturday Night Live, actually the opening sketch was really a lampoon of uh, Kathleen Sebelius, who's the U.S. kind of version of the Minister of Health in the whole uh, healthcare system. So you know that when you've made it as the opening sketch on Saturday Night Live, you've kind of captured something. So that's certainly, uh, this is probably the, on top of everyone's mind in the U.S. about Obamacare, whether you love it, whether you hate it. And so really my goal tonight, I'm going to try to present some of that to you. Really, hopefully you'll leave this room um, with a better understanding of Obamacare and really perhaps 
maybe you'll even more appreciate the Canadian system after this. I'm not sure. Um, I will kind of warn you, though, certainly I don't claim to be you know, an expert. I didn't help write the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I'm really experiencing it with other uh, Americans. And um, you know, certainly the other challenge is you know, how do you take such a complex piece of legislation and distill it down to some key uh, points. So I'm going to try to do that tonight, but certainly uh, that's why we have a question and answer period afterwards. So if you have specific questions that I didn't get to in my talk, feel free to, to fire away uh, at me. So I thought I would start, though. I, know I, I said I'd leave the politics behind, but I've included a few political cartoons, I think, to, to start the night. Of course, these are fairly easy to find when we're talking about Obamacare. And I like this first one. Uh, of course, here we have uh, Obamacare also goes by the name the Affordable Care Act or Health Reform. And so we have an individual holding a piece of paper, Health Reform, and someone obviously represented by the Republicans or, or the elephants. I've got a plan that's not single payer. Love it, right? So the Republicans love that. It gives private insurers more customers. Love it again. It makes freeloaders pay. Love it. It covers kids. Love it. It covers pre-existing conditions. So if you have another condition like diabetes or cancer, then you're, you're covered. Love it. It's called Obamacare. Hate it. Okay? Uh, here's another one, similar train of thought. I hate Obamacare. Health care reform should be repealed. Uh, which part? The part that ensures children aren't denied care due to a pre-existing condition? Uh, no, I like that. The part that allows kids to be covered by their parents' plan until they're 26? Uh, no, that's good. The part that stops insurance providers from dropping people when they get uh, seriously sick? No, that's great. It's the other part I can't stand. Uh, which one? The Obama part, right? And I've got one more for this side of the argument. Uh, why do you hate Obamacare? Because it's not going to work. Why are you so desperate to stop it? Because it's going to work, right? So again, that's kind of the, the kind of arguments you see. Now, to be fair, I've got a few uh, for the other side. So here we have President Obama saying, and everyone will have health care, and it won't really cost anyone, anyone anything, and on and on. And down here, instead of Disney World, we have DC World, the happiest place on earth, and pixie dust. So I think we got a sense, if you were watching some of the uh, election last year between Romney and Obama, a lot of this was kind of, you know, who could make the better promises. Uh, a couple more here. Um, the seed packet described it as a small flowering plant, and here we have the Obama cost, right? And I think this is another contentious point as far as certainly uh, President Obama, one of the, the, the selling points was this is actually going to save the U.S. healthcare system money. And I think we're kind of at the point where now we're, we're, not, we're not too sure. There's a lot of claims on different sides, um, but some would argue we're actually kind of on this, this side of things. And one more, here we have a patient representing uh, uh, Uncle Sam. He's got some sort of uh, attachment on his arm, Obamacare, and he's saying, shoot straight with me, doc, uh, is it bad? And uh, again, you know, we could go on. We could spend the whole night on political cartoons. This is, this is all I've got for tonight. Um, but it gives you a sense of really kind of the, the environment out there talking about Obamacare. I think that's one challenge, too, is even if you do want to be honest, you want to be objective, you know, people are so biased. There's so much misinformation out there. How do you go? So again, I'm going to try to be an honest broker. I'm, I'm not claiming to be perfect. And you might disagree with me on points tonight. But I'm really going to be try to be objective. And I've turned to information sources tonight that I believe are objective as well. So really four things we're going to talk about. We're going to kind of start off comparing um, the Canadian healthcare system uh, to the U.S. healthcare system. And we're going to do it from two perspectives. We'll do it from the perspective of physicians and we'll do it from the perspective of patients. Okay, so that's kind of going to start us off. Then we'll go through the basics of Obamacare. And again, it's a very complex piece of legislation. So I'm going to cover what I believe are the most important points. But if you have more specific questions, certainly bring those up later on. We'll then talk about the challenges in, in implementing Obamacare, kind of where we are right now with the implementation. Some things have already been implemented. We're at a big point right now that I'll talk about later. And there's a few more things have yet to come. And then uh, actually, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up, explore lessons for Nova Scotia. I actually believe there are a few lessons for our province that we could take from Obamacare. There's things that I think we would never want to take and we could leave behind uh, in the US, but there's some other things perhaps that would actually improve healthcare uh, in Nova Scotia. So let's start with the first thing, comparing and contrasting uh, Canada and the US. And I'm, what I'm gonna do, I know it's, you know it's around 6.40 at night, some of you might be starting to get sleepy, and probably the worst thing I can do is put up a bunch of graphs and charts. That's what I'm gonna do, okay? 
And uh, the reason is um, I'm turning to an information source called the Commonwealth Fund. Um, they're a large um, uh, uh, healthcare foundation. They're based in the U.S., but their whole purpose is to see what Western industrialized nations do related to healthcare and then to apply those lessons back to the U.S. And actually, when I was a faculty member uh, here at Dalhousie, I had the opportunity to spend a year with them and to learn about what they do. And I really like it because they do international surveys. They look again at Canada, the U.S., and other Western industrialized nations. So that's what we're going to look at. And first of all, we're going to look at the physician perspective. Any physicians in the room tonight? Okay, so a couple. Okay, so this is a, a physician. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Murray. It's nice, nice to have you here. Um, so this is the, the countries they've looked at. And again, I apologize. I know it's kind of small, small front. Across the top, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, UK, and US. I'm not, you'll be glad to know. I'm not going to go country by country, okay? But this is, again, a, a, a survey of physicians. It's a survey of about uh, 2,000 Canadian physicians and over 1,000 American. And we're going to start with the U.S. side. And this asks them different questions about their patients. In the 59, the, the first uh, number I've circled, that's the percent of their patients that often have difficulty paying for health care out of pocket. And if you do a quick scan there, you'll actually see the U.S. is the highest, and the highest by quite a bit. So we really see that. This a large number of American physicians realize their patients have difficulty paying for drugs. Now that, and this isn't just drugs, this is other lab tests and things. Now just pretend, pretend for a moment that you are a physician. Think of how this makes you feel ethically if you know your patients can't afford to pay for things. So that's the first problem. The next one, difficulty getting diagnostic tests and long waits to see a specialist. We actually see the numbers you know, aren't low, they're kind of in the middle here, about a quarter. And often, when you think of the U.S. healthcare system, one thing often we think of as being positive that there's no waits, right? You can get to see anyone, anytime. And I think certainly that's true if you have insurance. But again, if you don't have insurance, that's why we see these numbers still fairly high. So how does this compare to Canada? Uh, Canadian physicians still, about a quarter of Canadian physicians say their patients often have difficulty paying for things out of pocket. You may wonder, how can that be you know, with universal health care? Well, we know there's certain, for example, some drugs that might not be covered on a part of the uh, formulary, a part of a drug plan. There might be maybe ambulance rides and other things that aren't covered. And so, so there are some financial uh, barriers to Canadians. And then this is the last two are kind of certainly more the wait times, right? 38% of Canadian physicians saying their patients often have difficulty getting diagnostic tests. And 73% say it's a long wait uh, to see a specialist. And I think if you look at this, it's a lot of folks nodding their heads you probably agree that, again, there's some areas where the U.S. might be better, some areas where Canada uh, might be better. So this next one asks, um, again, it's, it's a physician, it's a question for physicians. Can your patients get a same or next day appointment? So the same 11 countries, the U.S., about half can get a same or next day appointment. And I have to say, our family experience, we have health insurance in the U.S., we can almost always, we have three young daughters, almost always get in the same day or next day. So it's been pretty positive for us. Uh, in Canada, again, the worst of those 11 countries, um, really hard to get uh, a same uh, or next day appointment. Um, this next question has two colors. The light blue is from 2009 and the dark blue 2012. So we can kind of see differences over a three year period. And this asks the physicians, does your healthcare system work well with only minor changes needed? Okay, and here the U.S. has the lowest, which in this case is the worst. So in 2009, 17%, uh, which is pretty low, right? 17% of U.S. physicians felt their healthcare system worked well, and that actually dropped as we're seeing Obamacare being implemented down to 15% last year. Not probably where we want to be. So if 85% of physicians basically saying the healthcare system does not need minor changes. How does that compare to Canada? Well, Canada's actually more in the middle here. So in 2009, a third of Canadian physicians, that actually improved up to 40% uh, last year. So again, if you, from the perspective of physicians anyway, phys Canadian physicians feel their system is working better than American physicians in, in their system. And this is my last one, looking just at the perspective of physicians. Let's say, d does uh, insurance restrictions for your patients ca cause many uh, major time constraints. So for example, if you're a physician and you, do you have to fill a lot of paperwork and extra forms in order to have perhaps a drug covered or a diagnostic procedure covered. And here as you see the U.S. has the highest, so this means they're the worst. 
So 52% of physicians saying this is a major time concern, where Canada is more in the middle, 21%. So again, we've seen kind of, in, and again, I didn't, I didn't just cherry pick what I thought would be you know, the worst or best. I, I tried to pick a variety of things. But we can see in some areas, perhaps, according to physicians, the US healthcare system might be better, and some areas might be worse. So let's move on to patients, and what, what does the general public feel about healthcare? So this is the same group, the Commonwealth Fund. This is a 2010 survey in the same 11 countries. And I will start with the US again. And this is a question asking you, do you feel that your country, the healthcare system in your country, only minor changes are needed, fundamental changes, or needs to re be rebuilt completely? And here we can see the US, 27% of Americans feel their healthcare system needs to be rebuilt completely. And that's actually the highest among all 11 countries, right? So that's pretty serious. If you feel your system, let's just start over, rebuild it completely, that's probably not ideal. How's that compare to Canada? Canada's more in the middle on the lower side only 10% of Canadians feel that the Canadian healthcare system needs to be built uh, completely. This next question asks patients, will I receive the most effective treatment if I'm sick? I think that's something we'd all want to know, right? If, if you're sick, do you have confidence that you're going to receive the most effective treatment that's out there? In the US is 70%, uh, which actually is tied for the second lowest. Canada's actually higher. And this one actually, I have to admit, was perhaps a bit surprising because we often think, again, it's easier to access care uh, in the US. But again, it's, remember, it's, it's easier to access care if you have insurance. This also surveys pa patients that don't have insurance uh, in the US. What about the quality of care you receive from your physician? And actually, this one's interesting because actually it's a tie. So 74% uh, of Americans felt the care they received from their doctor was very good or excellent. And in Canada, same thing, 74%, very good or excellent. So again, I've kind of compared the different countries as far as um, head-on surveys. I'd like to spend just a couple minutes talking a little bit more about the US healthcare system, where it is now before we move into Obamacare. Because I think we need to understand what are the problems in the US healthcare system? Why is it that Obamacare really arrived? If you remember back in the 90s, Bill and Hillary Clinton tried to do healthcare reform in the US and they got stopped. So why is it that we have all these pressures and Obama was able to succeed uh, with his efforts? Well, part of it goes to looking at just the general dynamic of who has health care insurance in the US. And if I had to pick kind of one thing that I think Obamacare does, it's really trying to get at this red part here. And these are the 16% of Americans that do not have health care insurance. So about 48, 50 million Americans, depending on how you cut it, do not have health care insurance. I can tell you my own family, my brother-in-law, uh, he lives in Phoenix, Arizona. His wife, they have uh, a, a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son, they do not have health care insurance. He works for a small auto body plant. The uh, company does not offer insurance to his employees. And so I'll talk a little bit more later about his name's Ryan, kind of what goes through his mind when they're deciding uh, what to do. But again, this is pretty big, right? So again, more people in the US do not have insurance than live in all of Canada. So that's a big, big number. About 49% of Americans have insurance through their employer, and that's where I am. So as a university professor, as a dean, I have insurance through my uh, employer. And you might be saying, well, maybe some of you might have insurance through your employer, but remember, it's, it's an add-on insurance to what's already provided by the provincial government, right? So in this case, my insurance through my employer covers hospitalizations, emergency department visits, uh, visits, visits to physicians, as well as drugs and dental and all those sorts of things as well. We have about 30% of Americans that are covered um, through the government, and the two major programs are Medicaid for low-income Amer Americans and Medicare for uh, seniors. Medicaid is going to pop up again a few times in this presentation because that's a second kind of key plank of Obamacare. And lastly, we actually have 5% of Americans that actually purchase insurance themselves. So for example, like my brother-in-law Ryan, if he wanted to, he could go to a company like a Blue Cross to an Aetna, uh, to a Kaiser, and say, I'm going to purchase insurance as an individual. What we find, though, the premiums are very, very high to do that. And so what we find is that you know, those 5% of Americans may have insurance, but a lot of them, if you look at the plans they have, they're not that great. They don't cover a lot of things. So who doesn't have health care insurance? Well, it's interesting. It varies a lot depending on where you live in the United States. So up until July this year, I lived in Arizona. About one in every six people in Arizona do not have health care insurance. I now live in Ohio, which is here, 
In Ohio, about one in every eight people does not have health care insurance. So it really di differs by, your, by where you live. It also differs demographically. Um, if you're Hispanic, you're less likely to have health care insurance. If you're 19 to 25 years old, you're less likely to have health care insurance. And, and if you're really what we call kind of the working poor, you're also less likely to have health care insurance. So again, it differs quite a bit. Uh, I think you know, the areas closer to Canada, especially the Northeast, more likely to have insurance. But certainly as you move further south or further west, you see more and more people without health care insurance. And of course, this is just uh, documented citizens, right? This is not capture kind of the 10 to 12 million illegals who live in the US as well. So I've thrown you all, oh, it's kind of perhaps not the best way to start, I've thrown you a lot of different graphs and stats. So what does this all mean, Neil? You might be asking that. You've thrown a lot at me uh, tonight. So this is just my opinion. So that's the caveat uh, with this slide. I would argue actually the US healthcare system seems to work well for patients who have insurance and also those who know how to navigate the system as well. So I think, again, if our family, um, you know, very pleased with the healthcare we provide. In fact, diagnostic tests and other things receive very well. I had a medical procedure done last uh, year. My best friend uh, here in Halifax had the same procedure done last year. Uh, he had to wait uh, five months and go to Toronto to have the procedure done. I came in on a Monday and the physician said, can, I can do it on Thursday. Um, so that's kind of, again, the difference as far as access to care. Um, the private sector component also can foster incredible innovation, right? If you think of some of the places like the Mayo Clinic, right? MD Anderson for cancer. Um, these are world, you know, John Hopkins, world-renowned places when world leaders get sick, they go. And just the innovation, I've really seen that as well with, with electronic health records uh, and just how they're um, incorporated with personal health records as well. So a lot of really uh, innovation as well in the U.S. Uh, multiple player pairs, though, certainly means uh, complexity. Now, in Canada, it's kind of uh, misleading to say that we only have one pair because certainly we have private insurance. You know, we have Medivy, Blue Cross, Green Shield, those things. So there are multiple pairs in Canada. But if we look at the core of hospital services, physician services, and, um, you know, we really are dealing with, with one major pair, which is the government. Whereas the U.S., obviously, it's all over the place. And the amount of regulation. So as I mentioned in my previous role, I think what Andrea mentioned in, in Arizona, working with hospitals, um, I had 15 rural hospitals that we worked with. Uh, each of those hospitals had about 6,000 different regulations they dealt with. And if it was a small little, you know, 10-bed hospital or a 1,000-bed hospital, it didn't matter. They were dealing with so many regulations, and obviously the legal system is a big part of that uh, as well. As I mentioned, I talked a little bit earlier about, uh, about Ryan. I think this is kind of, you know, we talk about stats and stuff, but there's kind of this hidden kind of um, almost emotional burden uh, for those that don't have insurance. And, you know, I think about Ryan, again, who's my brother-in-law in Phoenix. Uh, but a year ago, um, his four-year-old daughter, Rihanna, uh, got an ear infection. And again, remember, they don't have health insurance. And so, um, you know, I could just see in their family, you know, with texting and exchanging emails, they were trying to decide, do we take her to see a physician or not? And they decided we're just going to hold off, see if it gets better. Well, three days later, it actually got a lot worse. and ended up taking her to the emergency department, and it cost them $750. And you could kind of just kind of see, you know, no family, I would argue, should really struggle with that. Do we take our child to see a doctor or not? And, uh, you know, Ryan's, you know, a great guy. Um, you know, obviously, he and his wife were talking about this. They weren't, you know, abusing their child or anything like this. But it was, you could just see that struggle. And if you think, you know, there's up to 50 million Americans who are making those sorts of decisions uh, every day. The other thing as well, you know, certainly in Canada, there are some health disparities. We know there, there's groups like the First Nations people, perhaps. Um, you look at maybe urban versus rural, so, so someone living in Briar Island, Digby County has the same access to care as someone here in Halifax. But the disparities, you know, are small compared to really what we see in the U.S. And again, between the access to care, especially of those who have insurance and those who don't. And I tell you, that, you know, working in rural Arizona, that was probably the toughest part of my job. And we had 21 tribal nations, we had all the issues along the U.S.-Mexico border, and it was really challenging just for me emotionally, just dealing with the fact that um, we have such a wide variety in, in health outcomes and in a lot of disparities. So I think we need to re remember that point uh, as well. Um, I thought I would share this story as well, because this actually, I guess, could, could apply to the U.S. too, but um, when we're talking about disparities, you know, rural, I think, is a key part of it. And when you think about Nova Scotia, I know there's a lot of talk about restructuring health districts and, and implications for rural Nova Scotia. Has anyone been to Yuma, Arizona? Yuma, Arizona, okay. So it's probably not on anyone's bucket list of a place to go, to be honest. This is kind of what it looks like, barren desert. 
Uh, Yuma is uh, in Arizona. It's on the California-Mexico border. Uh, I don't know if I would tell people uh, this to their face who live in Yuma, but it's probably you know, one of the ugliest places I've ever been to. And uh, we were trying to recruit physicians. It was a really hard to get physicians to want to work in Yuma. And so twice last year, we worked with a consulting company that flew um, new medical graduates to Yuma who had never been to the desert before with the hopes of recruiting them there. Okay? So they flew them in. They got to the airport in Yuma. They would not get off the plane. <laughs> I, I'm serious. So they would not. They said, you know, just to skip the interview, I just want to go back home. I could never see myself working here. Now we got smart, and what we do, we fly people in at nighttime now, okay? <laughs> and they wake up in the morning. There's palm trees around, and, and it looks beautiful. But again, that's that's some of the challenges, right? Of as far as the U.S., how do you kind of break down those disparities? Of course, everybody wants to work. If you're a physician in the U.S., I would love to work in Scottsdale and buy a golf course, right? You have Uber rich people. You have all the snowboards come down in the winter. I'm going to make a lot of money. Do I want to work two hours away in Yuma? Eh, probably not. And there's no kind of government agency that's forcing me to, to, to move to Yuma as well. Um, I thought I'd kind of, before we move on to Obamacare, just share with you again, if some of you like, like stats. This is more of, um, I, guess, I guess, kind of quotes from folks. And these, this is from one of the town halls we did last year when we were talking about the rollout of Obamacare. It was in a, a community called Marana, kind of a suburban community. <laughs> And uh, it was really it was a room kind of very similar to this. Um, I spoke for about 10 minutes, and it was open mic. And we had community leaders there, we had healthcare professionals, and we had just people from the community speak. And so these are a few quotes uh, from that event. Um, this first one's from a nurse. And here she's talking about the Arizona Medicaid program, which is, again, the program for lower-income individuals. And she says, uh, there was a patient who earlier this week had a stroke. She needs extensive rehab but her Medicaid is expiring at the end of the month. So guess how much rehab she's going to get? Pretty much it's going to be zero. Uh, and so what happened, this person, this patient actually got a job, which you would think would be a good thing, right? But now she's making more money, she doesn't qualify for Medicaid, her employer doesn't provide health care insurance, so it's, for her actually it was a bad thing, she actually is going to be uh, missing her, her health care. Um, this was from the, the Chamber of Commerce uh, president, said the cost of health care insurance increased 30 to 40 percent on average over the past four years, and deductibles have increased sometimes up to $5,000. Companies are no longer paying for their spouses and children. The costs are too great uh, with health care uh, today. Um, this next one, this is from the uh, head of the Hospital Association in Arizona. He says, when we look at the physical health of our hospitals, you know we can't run a business at a negative operating margin. We've had over 45% of our hospitals in the last four months running at a negative operating margin. That is at a loss. This is unsustainable. We actually, um, last year in Arizona, one of our rural hospitals closed. And again, if you think about it, there's nothing, a lot of these are for-profit hospitals. If they're losing money, they're gonna close, right? So it's not as if the community has a lot of input. It was actually, they gave us 24 hours notice in that case that the hospital was, was closing. And the next one, hospitals at the beginning found efficiency savings through trimming and consolidation. Now we're down to skeleton of care, and we risk quality in our ability to provide care uh, with the next cuts. And last one, this is actually from another nurse. Uh, she said, when we talk about the overall state of healthcare in Arizona, the providers are looking like the patients they're treating these days. They're hurting. They need care, too. And just think of, imagine if you were a healthcare professional working in an environment, some patients don't have insurance. So what do you do? Do you turn them away? Do you still treat them? What, what do you do? All right, so I, again, I wanted to give you kind of that as a baseline of where healthcare is in the U.S. Again, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And now we're going to move on to Obamacare, because now I, can, I think you can see the reason why there was a strong desire to change the healthcare system, right? It's not working for all Americans. Why do we need to do something uh, different? So again, I warn you, it's very complex. I've tried to distill it down to as simple as I can. Um, but there's no getting around it. And actually, I think this is a picture of it, right? You've probably seen this. So this is the actual bill, but these are the regulations associated with it. It is really, really complex. And so I think that's, that goes into, I think, some of the misinformation as well about Obamacare. Is people either haven't read it or they don't fully understand it uh, as well. So if you recall, uh, President Obama was elected president in November 2008, and almost immediately, uh, if you remember, the economy was kind of crashing at that time. There was the auto uh, bailout. But almost immediately, healthcare kind of, he said, this is going to be what, what I'm going to do in my first uh, mandate as, as president, my first term. 
And so they moved quickly ahead, and if you remember, it was very controversial. At that time, the Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the presidency, so they really could kind of put it through, and it really did not have bipartisan approval. So it really was the Democratic Party that put it through. Um, so almost immediately then, starting in 2010, there were some things that took effect even before the Supreme Court looked into it. And we'll get to the Supreme Court in a couple of moments. So some things, I think as we go through this list, as you go through it, almost, I think we'd all agree that these are good things, right? And certainly I, I, I do. Uh, parents can keep their children and their health policies until they turn 26. That sounds pretty good, right? Insurers can no longer deny health coverage to children with pre-existing conditions up to this point. If you were a child, maybe you had diabetes or cancer, your insurance company could say, I don't want to cover you. you know, fine. Um, all new health plans, including Medicare, required to provide free, free uh, preventive care and immunization. So for example, up until that point, if you were a senior and you just wanted to go in maybe for a, a health checkup, um, you had to pay out of pocket for that was not covered by Medicare. Um, if there was a, you needed a test done or something like that, that was different. But this changed that where preventive care was now covered. And insurance companies cannot rescind coverage when someone, someone gets sick and cannot impose lifetime caps insurance. And the lifetime caps were fairly common in the US. Maybe it could be a million dollars. So once you've exceeded over a million dollars of expenses over your life, now your, your coverage uh, gets scaled back. So that was 2010. 2011, 2012 was a busy time. Um, one thing that uh, was implemented was uh, actually three things. Physician compare, nursing home compare, and hospital compare. And the idea was that um, they wanted to create very transparently uh, to the American public the quality of care provided by physicians, nursing homes, and hospitals. I actually have an app on my iPhone. It's called HCAPS. I can look up any hospital in the US. I can look at the hospitals around that hospital. And I can tell you in about five seconds how clean uh, the rooms are in the hospital, how much pain control the patients had in their hospital, did they receive good uh, discharge instructions from the nurse and from their physician, et cetera? So the idea was to make this very public and transparent available to anyone. I can also compare how that hospital is doing as national and state averages as well. Uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Innovation also said, we need to test new things and, and provide some financial incentives. So um, in 2012, they allocated a billion dollars, actually it was a, another billion dollars earlier this year, basically for people to try experiments maybe trying and maybe a different role of a nurse practitioner, right? Or maybe a different role of a physician assistant, or maybe uh, emergency healthcare or uh, ambulance services, trying in those in different roles. And so that was really to create innovation. Uh, limits are placed on non-medical spending by health plans. And if you remember the movie uh, Sicko with Michael Moore, there's a few scenes where Michael Moore's kind of interviewing some insurance executives. Um, I had the opportunity during my Commonwealth uh, Fund Fellowship to meet the CEO of one of those individuals who was in Sicko. He is the CEO of Aetna, and uh, he makes uh, $24 million a year. Uh, and in this small group, he was saying, well, you know, Aetna's in Hartford. I live in New York. I did not want to move out of New York. So I said, I'll, fine, I'll be your CEO if you fly me by helicopter every day to work. And that's what, that's what they do. They you know, pick him up in Manhattan, fly him by helicopter uh, to helicopter. So again, this was trying to get at some of that, which I think, you know, OK, it's fair enough to be, you know, have a good compensation if you have a big position, but that might be a little much, helicopters and 24 million. And so they put some caps. Uh, depending on the type of plan, they have to spend at least 80 to 85% on direct um, medical uh, costs. Uh, Medicare reduced payments to hospitals for potentially preventable readmissions for select conditions. And this is interesting, because prior to this, if you're um, a hospital and you have a patient in the hospital, and um, maybe they, they were for a heart attack, let's say. And let's say the care they received wasn't so great, um, but they, they're, they're in the hospital maybe for a couple weeks. You get paid for that, right? Let's say the, hospital, the patient gets discharged, goes back home. In another two weeks, they're back at the hospital. Because again, the care they received wasn't so great. Well, actually, prior to this, it was a perverse system. You actually got paid again, right? You got, you got the, a double dip because the patient's back in the hospital. And so the idea was, feeling that's not quite right, and that actually you should be penalized uh, for that. And so that's really what this was uh, all about. Well, that kind of leads us to summer 2012. If you remember just over a year ago, it was a big Supreme Court ruling. We were kind of wondering, how are they going to go? Are they going to strike down Obamacare, or are they going to uphold it? And it was actually kind of a mixed bag. They upheld most of it, but the one thing they said is that the states, you could, the federal government could not tell the states what to do with the expansion of Medicaid. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a few minutes because that's actually a fairly big um, 
has had a fairly big impact on Obamacare, and actually is going to create more disparity uh, across the U.S. We'll, again, we'll come back to that point in a moment. Um, also at that point, again, the U.S. Is, is, you know, the states can do certain things and the federal government can do certain things. Each state, um, through Obamacare, had to come up with a list of what they deemed to be essential health care services that would be covered by insurance. So that would include, you know, hospital care, uh, ambulance services, prescription drugs, maybe dentistry, maybe mental health. And each state could come up with their own list. So, for example, the list in Arizona looks different than the list in Ohio, where I live now. So if you think about really 50 different states all coming up with their own list of what they thought these essential health care services uh, would be. And this is really kind of um, what, what kind of led to this point is this insurance marketplace. And I'm going to come back to this again in, in a few moments. But the idea is that you created this marketplace, really this online website, just like if you went to Orbitz, look at flights, or Priceline to look at hotels, you could go to a similar website and find out all the health plans for your state that would be willing to cover you. And more, more than that, um, each insurance company that listed their plan had to list four different options, a bronze, silver, gold, platinum. I know you, it's hard to read in the top there, but let's read this. Every plan offered in the insurance marketplace must cover basic services, hospital and doctor visits, maternity care, mental health, and prescription drugs for starters. And as I mentioned previously, that differs by each state. So New Hampshire would look very different than Maine, look different than Vermont. In the marketplace, insurance providers will offer four plans based on their actuarial value or the percentage of healthcare expenses paid for by the insurer. So again, uh, in each state, the idea was to have multiple companies, Aetna, Blue Cross, Kaiser, all offering four different types of plans. We'll come back to this uh, as well a bit more. Another key part of Obamacare was to provide tax breaks to people. So when they went on those websites and they found, let's say, maybe they want to buy silver at, from Aetna, that there was actually some tax breaks to enable them to do that. If I, again, if I go back to my brother-in-law, Ryan, he might want to buy health care insurance, but you know, for a family of four, well, let's look at that. Family of four making 75,000, he does not make 75,000, uh, 11, almost $12,000 a year in premiums. That's just premiums, not including co-pays and deductibles and other things. Not many people can afford that much if you're kind of middle income or lower income. And so the idea was that with Obamacare, you actually provide tax credits to drop that price. And so again, if you look at that, before, if Ryan was going out there to buy insurance for his family, 12000 now under Obamacare, he would go again that website, the, the um, marketplace, find a plan, and then he would get a $4,700 tax credit, which actually brings the real price down to 7000 You could say, Neil, 7000 is still a lot of money. And I think that's the challenge is, you know, is it bringing it down enough that you'll get all the Ryans of the world to want to buy health care insurance? So that kind of brings us to this year, 2013. And so those health insurance exchanges, the website went up on October 1st. And that's probably what a lot of the media, perhaps you've been seeing about that, because there's been a lot of issues in the US about, and that's really why Kathleen Sebelius was on Saturday Night Live, uh, the, the parody, uh, because of the, the technical problems. And um, again, you know, I think some of the challenges is, you know, um, it's good that there's millions of Americans that want to buy insurance that are, are going on these websites. But I think the challenge is the pushback is, you know, were they really ready for this influx of people to buy insurance? Uh, each state, as I mentioned, the Medicaid part um, was the part of the Supreme Court, which again, just to repeat, um, the Supreme Court ruled that each state could decide if they want to expand Medicaid or not. Okay? And so the idea is that states this year, they had to decide if they're going to do expand Medicaid. And the federal government, the, the, the kind of the little carrot there was that through Obamacare, the federal government would pick up 90% of the cost. So if the state said, yes, we will expand Medicaid, the federal government would pick up 90% of those costs. Well, what we saw, probably not too surprisingly, is that the more Republican states pretty much said, no thanks, and the more Democratic states said, sure, let's do that. And so we have about an even split. There are a few exceptions. It was interesting, actually, Arizona, where, where I was, a Republican state, a Republican governor who um, has very public disagreements with Obama, she actually said, this is too good of a deal to pass up. The federal government's going to pick up 90% of my costs. She actually was able to convince the, health, the hospital association to pick up the other 10%. So it cost her state zero to expand Medicaid. And she actually got that passed. Now, for her, 
the real cost was political capital, because she's been called a traitor, and pretty much I think her, her political career is over. Ohio, where I live now, was just passed uh, this week. Again, it's a Republican governor in Ohio, um, and they decided to go ahead. So again, most Republican states, like uh, for example, um, Texas, Florida, have said thanks but no thanks. Most Democrat states, like California and New York, have said yes, we'll, we'll go ahead with that. Um, you've kind of heard the, the Supreme Court also said they upheld what was called the individual mandate, which is called that we, we require individuals to purchase health care insurance. And I told you in the previous slide, you get a tax credit if you buy it. There's also the hammer side, which means actually you get a tax penalty if you decide not to buy health care insurance. Now I have to tell you, it starts off pretty small. Next year, it's 1% of your salary or $95. That's not going to dissuade many people, but it does start to ramp up. And so in three years, it'll be 2.5% of your salary. And so the idea is that you do a combination of tax credits, so it's easier to buy health care insurance, and tax penalties if you don't insurance, buy insurance. The idea is that you, kind of, you start to see a, a, maybe a, a switch in the balance, where it makes it um, more economic sense to buy insurance. Um, there also is a requirement of employers to offer insurance, exceptions for small employers, although that's been pushed back. Uh, to 2015. And uh, business side, I'm not going to go through this, but I just want to, sh to say that for those of you that maybe are more interested in the employer side, uh, again, if you're an employer over, they have more than 50 uh, em employees, um, there basically are pretty strong incentives for you to offer insurance. The catch is, though, and this has been a pretty big loophole, is that these are full time employees. Now, it's interesting, before I left Arizona, um, I went to my favorite Subway restaurant, and I got to know uh, the, the lady there pretty well. And she was kind of sad this one day, and I was kind of, you know, what, what's wrong? She said, well, my hours just got cut back. And she said, I'm now working 29 hours a week. And, and I said, well, what's, what's going on? You guys seem like a busy place. Why are you cutting? Well, she said, Subway's cut back countrywide, every one to 29 hours, because 30 hours is full time. Um, and so we've seen that as well, the fast food industry in particular, and service industry in the U.S., They've really cut back. And so that's, I think, the other challenge. There's a lot of unintended consequences of Obamacare. Um, and certainly in that case, you know, Subway said, hey, it's easier to cut back to part time rather than having to, to provide health care uh, insurance. At the same time, too, and I know I kind of, that was kind of a bad thing about Subway and, and, and stuff, but at the same time as well, the employers are really struggling in the US with the cost aspect. And in 2003, for instance, um, the total uh, annual cost for, for a family would be about $9,000 with about 6,600 picked up um, by the employer. You go to that to this year, for a family for the annual cost of health care is about 16000 with the employer picking up about 12000 So again, this is you know, considerable cost. Again, if you're a Subway, right, restaurant, you're deciding, okay, this is a person that makes $10 an hour. Do I want to spend $11,000 a year providing health care insurance? Uh, to this individual. And again, I mentioned in my own family, we actually spend more than 4,500. We spend 7,000 a year in, uh, in premiums for, for my family of, of uh, five. So if you look at kind of Obamacare versus Canada, some key differences. This actually uh, came from the Globe and Mail. I thought they did a nice summary. Actually, Joe Byrne, who's the director of school, forwarded this to me um, a couple weeks ago. So Obamacare certainly is not single payer. And if you think of the early days when, a, when Obama was elected, he actually was kind of arguing we need to have a single-payer system. That got shot down pretty quickly because uh, he realized there were a lot of Americans that weren't comfortable with that. So Obamacare is never going to be a single-payer. It's not about that, so it will always be different from Canada in that regard. Of course, in Canada, you could argue we're not really single-payer either because there's a role for private insurance in the marketplace. It's also not universal coverage. So in Canada, really that's kind of a basic tenet of the Canada Health Act, right? It's universal coverage. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, your background, your race, uh, your income, your gender, all that, you're gonna have access to health care. Well, in the US, we're seeing that's not necessarily so. The Obamacare will certainly, ideally, provide health care insurance to, to the uninsured, but not all 48, 50 million uninsured are going to have health care insurance. Um, it certainly is not national health insurance. In fact, Obamacare has really fractured it more in that you're going to have larger differences between states. Because again, some states have said, we will go ahead and expand Medicaid. Others have said, no, we're not. So it actually, in some ways, has actually made it even uh, the differences greater. Uh, equal access. So in Canada, you know, we like to think that, again, it doesn't matter who you are or which politicians you know, that you know, I'm going to have the same place in the queue in the line as the next person. 
Uh, and in the U.S., again, that's not going to happen. We always saw there's different levels of plans, right? The gold, the silver, the bronze, the platinum. Um, again, there's still going to be multiple insurance companies out there. Uh, in most states, you have at least five different insurance companies that are vying for your business. And again, those insurance companies all have their, their, uh, their doctor networks, their dentist networks, their, their pharmacy networks. And also, you could also, maybe it's not about cost containment in that, you know, in Canada, it is easier certainly for governments to control healthcare costs. They, for example, they negotiate with a, a society of physicians and look at salary. They provide budgets to district health authorities. Well, none of that happens under Obamacare. And so it may reduce costs. It may not. We just don't know at this point. So that's kind of where we are with, with Obamacare. Where are we, I guess, I guess, as far as implementing the next steps? And, uh, you know, this is Nancy Pelosi, uh, of course, who was the leader of the Democratic Party of Congress. She kind of had this, fa this statement she probably would like to take back now, but it's kind of uh, become famous in the U.S. She said, we have to find it to find out what's in it. So she was saying we need to pass Obamacare to find out what's in it. And now, I don't know if this is the case where we're finding it's workers' hours cut. Like I talked about Subway, uh, layoffs, maybe higher premiums. Again, this is all bad. I think there's some good things as well. But we're kind of just finding out now. You know, a piece of legislation that's so complex, it's probably not surprising that we're really starting to discover right now what it's all about. And as I mentioned, each state has really decided themselves whether they want to expand Medicaid. Uh, again, the, the red states are the ones not expanding, which are, are generally Republican states. The green are the ones which are expanding, and the yellow have uh, not decided. Again, Ohio, where I live, just went from a yellow uh, to a green uh, this week. So again, it's, it's certainly we're going to have even more inequality across the country. Um, of course, this is what's in the news right now, these exchanges, right? So this guy's saying, I'd like to exchange Obamacare for something else. And uh, it's certainly, I think this is the challenge. You know, with, uh, this is really where the rubber beats the road right now with these health insurance exchanges. Are they going to work? Are people going to find plans that they like? And, uh, you know, there's a lot in the U.S. media right now, both patients and individuals that have found good plans and those that have not found plans. And again, this really differs by state. Uh, for example, in New Hampshire, there's really only one insurance plan that covers the whole state. And so for many individuals, maybe in New Hampshire, they're finding there's really not that many options and, and not someone that will provide good insurance. And this is the, the central website, uh, healthcare.gov, um, where it has kind of the infamy right now with all the website crashes and stuff. But again, this is where most Americans are going. You actually can still use other states, uh, other websites, but this is the main one that most Americans are, are going to. So um, these are, and uh, again, October 1st was a rollout of the health insurance exchanges. And so there's been a lot, again, in the U.S. media the last few weeks about uh, the experiences. So these are just some quotes from an article in our local newspaper in Cincinnati on October 3rd. And it says, first quote, in initial interest uh, in signing up was so strong it crashed the website. And I guess, that, again, that's good that there's this kind of pent-up demand, if you would, of people just, you know, have been waiting to have health care insurance. You know, 48 million Americans that don't have it, finally there's something that's for them. The insurance companies can't say no. It's perhaps more affordable. They, they can't wait. And so I think that's good, maybe, that websites are crashing because it shows that people are interested in it. Um, on the other hand, some technical glitches. So one person said, I couldn't pull up any of the plans for Ohio. Uh, again, people are really having a lot of difficulty. Uh, John Boehner, who's from Cincinnati, who's the Republican Speaker of the House, says the law is not ready for prime time. Whereas President Obama came back and said the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, is still open for business. So I guess, you know, we really kind of need to see how it rolls out. We really are at this critical point. I think a lot of, on both sides, we're having kind of maybe cheap political points right now. But it's really going to see, you know, can we get over these initial technical glitches and can people really sign up for health care insurance? So kind of what to watch. How will we know whether it works? Well, there's a few things. Um, first thing, I think, are all these marketplaces fully operational by December 15th. That's a critical date because by, people have to sign up by December 15th if they want health care insurance on January 1st. So if they have not signed up by that date, they're not going to get health care insurance. Okay? So that's critical. So while we have a lot of Americans now, we actually have still another two months to go, or I guess about a month and a half, until we reach December 15th. Also, it's the number of people who are underinsured or have high out-of-pocket costs uh, falling. And so, example, you know, do we, do we really see that going on uh, in the U.S.? Our third, are people enrolling in health plans? So uh, both expansion of Medicaid and um, through these health insurance exchanges. And lastly, is the number of uninsured Americans decreasing? Um, 
kind of one estimate is that if we see a decrease by 13 million by uh, the end of next year, that would show that we're making some progress. Again, we're not expecting all 48 million Americans that don't have health care insurance to finally have it, but we'd like to see certainly a significant portion of those to, to receive insurance. And again, the cost part, I would have to say, is kind of yet to be determined. So again, going back to the, uh, the initial uh, 2008, uh, Obama saying, my plan will reduce premiums by 2,500. And again, we've got a lot of different people have weighed in, some saying actually may increase costs by 32%, others saying, no, it's just too early, we're not sure yet. And I think this might actually might be the tipping point as well, is if we do see cost savings. So that's kind of where we are at Obamacare. I thought I'd kind of conclude with, what are some lessons from Nova Scotia? So in this craziness that's going on south of the border, are there actually some take home points uh, for the healthcare system in Nova Scotia? And then we'll open it up for, for questions. So I think, think the first things, you know, I would argue certainly the focus on quality measurement, uh, transparency, and public reporting are all great things. Now I realize that, you know, it might be a little different in the US where you have maybe, you know, 10 different hospitals in your city, they're all com competing for your business. It's interesting, if you drive on the, the highway around Phoenix, Arizona, there's electronic billboards uh, from Scottsdale Healthcare. And they actually tell you what the wait time is in the emergency department, because they want you to come to their emergency department. So, you know, it's a very different mentality there. Obviously, in the can, I don't know if we have the opposite message, like don't come to our emergency department, it's, it's full. Um, as you can say, you know, why do we need transparency when you can't really choose anyway, when there's one hospital in my town or whatever. But I would argue, no, no. in fact, since, you know, as, as taxpayers, you're paying for the healthcare system, we should actually have more transparency in it. We don't like it when our politicians do things in secret. For healthcare, which for most of us is one of the key interactions with government, why should they do things in secret as well? So I think the transparency of public reporting, things like the apps on the iPhone or websites so you can compare hospitals, wouldn't it be nice to know which hospital in Nova Scotia has the cleanest rooms? Pretty basic thing, right? How do you figure that out? Well, you survey patients after they are discharged from the hospital, and you ask them that. That would be going to, and then you find out which hospital does it the best. What are they doing right about that? And which hospitals are doing the worst? Well, is there something they can do differently? So I think that's a key part. Um, linking quality and payment that kind of takes it up to the next the next level. It's nice to report things, but okay, fine, you know, we're reporting things, but how about if you link payment uh, to quality? So again, we're seeing that in the U.S. where, again, if patients are readmitted to the hospital within 30 days for something that was preventable, the hospital is not getting paid for that. Well, why can't we do the same thing in Canada, where maybe if, um, you know, certain health districts are doing things better, patient outcomes are better, they actually receive a bonus. They get, we get extra money to spend the, the, the next year. Um, and so I think there's ways we could do that as well. Uh, one thing I didn't go into a whole lot, but there's a lot of Obamacare that talks about health uh, workforce planning, forecasting future needs and demographic changes. And that's kind of looking at the basic things. You know, how many doctors do we need in a given area um, five years from now? And so I know in, in my office, our Center for Rural Health in Arizona, we went uh, every county in our state, um, we did uh, calculations for 19 different health professionals. Everything from ambulance drivers to nurse practitioners to dermatologists. And we would look at, do we have enough, and what are the needs in that county? So is the population growing in that county? Is it an aging demographic? And then we'd work with the, um, the different schools, you know, the medical school, the farm school, nursing, and look at, are we producing enough of those graduates? And linking that together, really, we could start to forecast needs uh, for, for that. Uh, increased role for allied health professionals as well. I know we're seeing you know, some of this in Nova Scotia, certainly nurse practitioners over the past few years, the collaborative care practices, more recently with pharmacists giving flu shots. Um, but I have to tell you, this is one area where the U.S. is quite far ahead. Uh, just for example, one part of the Affordable Care Act uh, that started to be implemented in 2010 uh, were what we call community health centers. And in Arizona, we had 150 of them. And about 70 of those were in, in rural parts of Arizona uh, that were under my office. Well, in a community health center, the interesting part, the one thing, first thing that was missing, there were no hospital beds. Okay, so community health center had no hospital beds. And in that community health center were um, your primary care physician, your specialists, laboratories, so if you needed a lab test done, uh, mental health services, there was a pharmacy, um, there was a dentist, and all linked together by an electronic health record. So when you went and saw the physician, and they typed that in, and maybe then you went and saw the nurse practitioner, or the dentist, or the pharmacist, mm -hmm. they could all see that interaction. 
And um, you know, certainly uh, physicians played a key role in that, but it was really all about a healthcare team working together. And um, I, you know, I would argue that's really more efficiently using our resources. We, physicians, just like here in, in Nova Scotia, especially uh, family physicians, are really stretched thin. They have a lot of pressures, um, a, a big burden. And in Arizona, we found that really kind of lightened the load for them so that they could more effectively use their time. The last thing I probably I thought I couldn't end a talk without going to this little topic, which I know certainly uh, as a result of, of your recent provincial election is, is, uh, is inter interest, many here in the room are interested in this. And uh, as you know, certainly other provinces across Canada have looked at um, restructuring. As you know, Alberta has one district, uh, PEI has one, uh, New Brunswick two, and Nova Scotia. Um, certainly there's, um, if, uh, um, the, the Liberal government has, you know, part of their campaign was talking about, well, maybe reducing the number. Now, I'm not, this isn't a cop-out. I'm not going to have an exact opinion on this. But I will say that, um, and again, this is just my opinion only as far as uh, the caveats. Um, you know, certainly the status quo is, is probably not going to work if you think of Nova Scotia, the demographics and kind of where Nova Scotia is headed with health care costs. So keeping things the same is probably not an option. At the same time, just changing things especially if we're converting maybe to one or two health authorities, is, is traumatic. Actually, it will paralyze the healthcare system for probably up to two years. Um, a huge impact. So now that I've said staying the same is bad and changing is bad, where, where do we go? Um, you know, I would argue that you, know, you certainly need a proper balance. You do need that local input and representation. I know in my role in Arizona, we spent a lot of time with local communities making sure that they, their interests were met. Um, rural communities in Nova Scotia, are very, very different from each other. There's a saying when you've seen one rural community, you've seen one rural community. You know, are the healthcare needs, again, in Shelburne the same as Inverness? Are they the same in Pugwash as in Bridgewater? And you would probably argue, no, they're not, versus, of course, Halifax and their needs. So I think, you know, it's, it is, I think, uh, commendable to relook at healthcare delivery in the province. I guess what I would argue, certainly if the Liberal government decides to go with one or two or three districts, that they think about perhaps having an organization like a center for rural health, like we had in Arizona, um, to kind of make sure that the needs of the rural parts of the province are still met. All 50 states in the U.S. have a, a state office of rural health care, even urban ones like Rhode Island and New York. And um, certainly, again, their roles are, again, to ensure that rural interests are being met. They do things like predicting, um, looking at, at workforce needs. So again, do we have enough nurse practitioners in this county? If not. And, and a lot of our work also was, was municipal leaders. How can we recruit? I told you what we did in Yuma. Uh, but we work with all the different communities to really figure out, okay, why would a family physician want to work in this community? And once we found that, I tell you, we drilled that message. We went over and over again with headhunters and med school students. And we really worked to, to find out how do we recruit healthcare professionals to that community. So again, good luck certainly in, in Nova Scotia. I'm not sure where, where that'll be headed, but um, it certainly is an interesting time. So with that, I know it's been a lot tonight. You might be feeling like this, uh, way uh, too much information. I tell you, it's a heavy subject. You should be congratulated just for surviving this talk because I know I crammed a lot in. But at this time, I'd be pleased to, uh, to answer any questions. So thank you very much. We've got some time to uh, open up the floor uh, to some questions uh, for Dr. Neil McKinnon. So if you have a question, if you could please raise your hand and then I will bring the mic to you. So I see one, two, and three, so I'll start with that order. Hi, I don't know if you watched Bill Maher on Friday night. Did you see what Michael, no, no. oh, Michael Moore stated that the company that was running the American website was a Canadian company who had been fired for having botched up running the Canadian website. And I'm not exactly sure what Canadian website he would be talking about and what company he was talking about. Do you know anything about that by any chance? Oh, I think someone, I, I don't, someone in the audience, no? CGI? Okay, so there is, uh, so I guess it is true then, so there's a Canadian company that's involved. You know, what's interesting, certainly, um, is I, I, I focus this talk on that central website. Um, but one, you know, I could go into a million details. Um, 14 states actually have gone on their own and have created their own website. So the federal government in the U.S. actually gave each state the choice, besides expanding Medicaid or not, do you want to have your own website or do you want to use the federal one? 
And 14 states said, we'll actually create our own. So we actually have a few states, uh, Massachusetts, I believe Kentucky's another one that's gone. And those, for the most part, actually are working fairly well. It's actually this federal one, which about 36 states that are part of, but we've had most of the problems. So um, now having said that, I actually follow, you know, Kathleen Sebelius on Twitter. And it's interesting just to get their updates and, and what's going on. So, you know, I think certainly this, you know, they've, it is a credibility issue now. I mean, people need to have access to a website that works, it doesn't crash. And so this is really critical. You know, the next few weeks, will it really work or not? I think if it works, this will be forgotten. People will be more than happy they have insurance. If it doesn't, certainly it's giving the Republican side ammo. And, you know, they need to fix these problems quickly. So, so key, key issue for sure. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the expansion of Medicaid. Like, what's the, why is it important to Obamacare that they want, obviously, that if they're willing to pay 90%, for states to expand, what's what's their goal? What's the whole intent of that? Right. So again, each there's 50 states in the U.S. Each one approaches Medicaid differently, meaning that they have different levels of eligibility. Some states, you actually, even if you're below the poverty poverty line, you still might not qualify. Other states, it's 100 percent. So if you're at the poverty line, you qualify. Obamacare wants to raise that to 133 percent. So if you make more than 33 percent which is still not much, over the poverty limit, then you'll be able to qualify. And they want that across all the states, okay? So that's really what was the piece in Obamacare that the uh, Supreme Court basically essentially threw out. Said each state, you can't, federal government cannot tell the states where to raise that, that bar. That's under state control. Um, but the carrot, again, is that Obama, under Obamacare, the states that do raise it to 133%, the difference from where they were the federal government picks up 90% of that cost, which is huge, right? And so it's a pretty big carrot. As we saw, for example, in Arizona, even with the Republican governor, she said, that's just too good of a deal to pass up. And so, you know, that's just what's surprising, that, you know, all the states have not uh, done that, because it is a, is a good deal. And I think as, you know, Canadians, we kind of struggle, you know, why wouldn't you want to help those, those lower income? Um, so, you know, it is what it is, um, but that, that's really kind of where we are with, with, with Medicaid. Thank you for your talk, very yeah. interesting. I was wondering if you could just comment briefly on the ethics of who gets what when, and you talk about uh, the uh, surveys and the delays in care. So here, one way to cap your costs or control your costs is to constrain your uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a huge increase in demand because all of a sudden you have a, a segment that's now accessing uh, services where they hadn't in the past, to control costs, and the debt, which really is uh, getting out of hand, uh, will there be uh, an ethical question around? It's not first come, first serve, or he who can pay. Uh, it's uh, this procedure, this person, this bed, this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody else drops further down the list or does not get access. Do you see uh, a role for ethics in uh, gatekeeping? Yeah, well, certainly ethics and healthcare are so intertwined, aren't they? And really, it's almost every country has their own framework, their ethos that they're using. Obviously, for most Western industrialized nations, they've chosen that, um, you know, healthcare is kind of assumed as a basic right, like education. You know, Germany's had national healthcare insurance since 1883, the UK since World War I, um, Canada, we were a little bit later. And if you think it really came from Tommy Douglas, who was a Baptist minister. I mean, so obviously there's a relationship between ethics and theology. If you think even in Canada, you know, a lot of early health care was, 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 was faith-based. Um, so there is a relationship with that. Um, the U.S. obviously, you know, it's kind of surprising, but, you know, there is, I think the, the overriding kind of ethical framework is individualism, right? And we've kind of seen that brings out the best in America with creativity and you know, new things and capitalism and, and wealth creation I and mean, a lot of good stuff. But the downside is you don't have that social safety net uh, as well. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's, I have to say, you know, that's probably the hardest part myself as a Canadian working in there. Because uh, obviously I, I, I believe more in the Canadian system where we need to have that safety net. And so um, it'll be interesting if, if it changes. Um, I think your point of if we have suddenly, you know, 20, let's say 20 million Americans in January have health care insurance for the first time in their life entering the health care system, does that start to cause delays and lines and stuff? 
Uh, if you think back the, in the 80s, some of you might remember the state of Oregon actually tried to do a rationing thing where they actually prioritized different medical procedures and they kind of went through their budget until they said, okay, we're out of money, procedure number 250, whatever it was, and 251 does not get funded. So that was a pretty overt way to, to blend the two. So I don't think that's going to come anytime soon. Um, but, but you're right, there's a lot of different um, ethical considerations for sure. Right, I think you could argue that, I mean, that's the case in Canada and other countries too, right, not just, not just the U.S. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many different ways you can cut this and, and ethical things. I think it's a gold mine. If anyone's here as a medical ethicist, maybe you are. There's a lot of material here to work with. Um, but I think, you know, at, at a foundational, the basic kind of healthcare ethic framework, I think, you know, you have countries that really believe healthcare is a basic right, like education that should be provided, and others that say no, you know, it's really up to the individual, not government, to, to make that call. And um, again, you know, who, who's right? I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, it certainly makes it, makes it interesting. Of what was just said in your response, um, and you look at the U.S.'s individualism and can, the Canadian perspective of collectivism, you know, maybe that answers this question, but how did the insurance companies get such a stranglehold on the healthcare system in the U.S.? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I think it really comes more from, um, because the U.S. did not have a national insurance system, certainly since 1965 they've had Medicaid and Medicare, it really came through your employer, right? And it was really, you know, to be, I guess, to put a positive spin on it, was really a recruitment tool that employers used, you know, post-World War II, in the 50s, kind of bringing people back, you know, starting to offer health insurance programs was kind of a perk. And so I think that's really where it came from. And certainly then employers, you know, thought, I can't manage healthcare, it's too complex, let's contract with an insurance company to manage that for us. And that's really where you saw the growth. So it's a little different than the Canadian model where we already had, you know, since Tommy Douglas, that kind of general, the Canada Health Act and the framework where employers, you know, could still offer benefits in Canada but it's really kind of supplemental benefits. Um, whereas in the US, it's really, the heart of it came from employers, right? Um, and so again, they worked with insurance companies. Um, and that's really, I think, a fundamental difference. That's why we had, you know, 50, 49% of Americans that have healthcare insurance is through their employer. Great, so I think we've got time for maybe one more, and I did see a hand up over here. Neil, the single payer in healthcare in Canada is a thing which is probably 20 years old and is now going out of date. Actually, for medical care, there are 12 payers. And for pharmaceutical care now in the insurance companies, they are getting into the act. I say that because I recently went to Ontario, had to go to a doctor. The doctor billed me $70. I came back to Nova Scotia. They reimbursed me 40 uh, my prescription, uh, I'm covered by Atlantic Blue Cross, that wasn't recognized in Ontario, and when I came back, it wasn't covered under my plan. So really, there's, there, Canada is starting to go U.S. bound, and until, if the government here doesn't start doing something about it, it's uh, going to be bad, hey? Eh? So there's actually 11 pairs. Right, and certainly even, even more than that, if you consider you know, the military and uh, in different aspects. So. You're right, I mean, it's, you know, in some ways, obviously, there's a balance between kind of explaining concepts and kind of, you know, uh, keeping it simple versus the complexity. And the Canadian healthcare system is very complex, if you think about it, um, a lot of different things. If you think of a few years ago, kind of the Canadian military got a little bit of controversy here because they were using the MRI clinic up on, on uh, Lacewood Drive to kind of bypass the, the, uh, the public system. So there's a lot of kind of loopholes and different things. And, you know, actually, I was in a meeting in Washington, D.C., uh, about six years ago, Tony Clement was our Minister of Health at the time. And I couldn't believe he said this at a meeting, but he said, our safety valve in Canada to let out steam in the healthcare system is the U.S. Meaning that we go to the U.S., you know, when, when you need access to care, you can't get it in Canada. I couldn't believe he said that at a national meeting. Um, but, but you're right, there's, you know, the Canadian healthcare system as well is facing a lot of pressures. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, you know, 10, 20 years from now, will maybe the two systems start to become more similar or 
or push back. I would say, you know, the, the fundamental difference, so I think, again, most Canadians, you kind of saw that in the survey of physicians and of the general public, you know, most Canadians feel that we need to have, you know, a basic national system. Um, most Americans, again, that's really up in the cards. 50%, that's why you see the, the split with Obamacare, right? 50% really like it, feel it, it's, it's a good thing, it's needed. 50% say no, it's government taking over. I, I, I want to have control. So, a great question though, Tom. Great, well lots of food for thought um, and uh, some great questions asked of Neil. Uh, just wanted to uh, um, have everybody join me in thanking uh, Dr. Neil McKinnon again for such a great <laughs> speech. We have a little token of appreciation from the School of Health Administration. It's an iceberg award for uh, Dr. Nomikin. All right, thank you. So thank All you. Right, very much. Thank you.